Okay, so hello everyone. Hopefully you can you can hear me correctly. Uh, please uh, uh, type in the text box if you can hear me so that I know that the audience online can listen to what I'm saying. I guess this is a yes from the previous meeting. Okay, I can do. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, I can speak. Yeah, can you hear me? Is that okay? Okay, then we can start. Is it what? It should. Let me check it in the chat. Not chat, sorry, in the, in the participants. It is recording in the conf, which means should be okay. 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 Ah, okay, I see that I have the okay, yeah, okay. Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Bruno Ramo and I'm a PhD student at the University of Minho in Portugal. And to today I'm here to give um, a course on the method of manufacture solution, which is a suitable approach for code verification. Uh, this presentation has the following outline. As soon as it changes the slide, which is okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's the method of manufacture solution, what it is used for. And afterwards, I'm going to give you an example of application of the method of manufacture solution with Laplace and foam. And if we have time, an example with scalar transport foam. Okay. So the main takeoffs from this presentation are the following. I would like that by the end of this presentation, uh, you would know what the method of manufacture solution is and how to apply them. I would like to show you how to calculate the forcing term, how to implement this within OpenFOAM, how to implement appropriate boundary conditions, and how you calculate the error norms. We're going to do this in two, in two approaches. We're going to use what I have labeled as standard OpenFOAM approach and use that code that functionality of OpenFOAM, which is a less invasive approach uh, within the OpenFOAM framework. Finally, we're going to exercise the method of manufacture as a solution by performing a mesh refinement study to carry out co the code verification. For you to understand this uh, training session, you will need some knowledge on Python programming, not too much, but at least some, some knowledge on Python, and some knowledge on how to code uh, in C++ in the context of uh, OpenFOAM. Okay, so, what is the method of manufactured solutions? What is code verification? Why do we need this? Um, when we are developing code, usually we want a way to verify that the code we are implementing is working properly. One way to do this is to carry out, or one of the most robust ways to do this is to carry out um, a mesh refinement study and to look at the order of convergence, okay? So what you want is to solve the Laplace of something. You want, you want to discretize your Laplacian with some approach. If the method is consistent, as you progressively refine your mesh, you should get a result that's closer and closer to the mathematical model. And that's what you want to check, okay? And your discretization is going to have an order of convergence, and we want to see if our solution will get that order of convergence, okay? In OpenFOAM, we have a variety of, uh, of solvers for different physics, okay? And usually, uh, if you go in literature, you will see for some simplified case, where it's two dimensional and some terms in your partial differential equation or your system of partial differential equations are cut out for some simplification and you carry out a, uh, 
an assessment of the order of convergence, and that is an okay approach. But I'm here today to talk about a more robust approach to do this. Okay, and this is the method of manufactured solution. Um, in this method, we are going to define the solution to our system. So we're going to say in our domain, the solution is some function, and we're going to force our system to give us the correct solution. Okay. And um, we are going to do this forcing by including a um, driving term or a search term that will drive our solution to be what it is in conjunction to appropriate boundary conditions. Okay, let us give an example on how, how to do this because the methodology in itself is quite straightforward. Let's imagine that we have a solution where we have our, uh, our partial differential equation, which is some uh, differential operator applied to our unknown equal to a source term, okay? We're going to calculate the driving, the, the driving term or the driving or the source term to drive to our solution by applying every differential operator to our manufactured solution, okay? And we get out of this a, a, a driving term or a source term to include in the system. Uh, on the right hand, on the left hand side, you will see an example. Let's assume that we are using the steady state solution for the heat equation, so we have the Laplacian of temperature, okay? Uh, we decided that the solution for this system is going to be the cosine of alpha x plus the sine of beta y, okay? For us to calculate the driving, the driving term, we're going to apply every differential operator that is in a partial differential equation with our manufactured solution, and this will result in a source term, okay? Now we're going to implement this source term into our original partial differential equation. We're going to solve the system in a slightly different manner. It's no longer the Laplacian of temperature equals to zero. It's the Laplacian of temperature equals to our uh, driving uh, to our source term. And we're going to implement, in conjunction with this, appropriate boundary conditions. Um, in this system, or in this methodology, you get the other advantage that you can get the manufactured solution. From the manufactured solution, you can get the, um, you can get the boundary conditions to use. If you want a fixed value boundary condition or a Dirichlet boundary condition, you can straight up use your manufactured solution, evaluated at each x, y position on your boundary. If you want a fixed gradient boundary condition, you can take the gradient of your manufactured solution and evaluate it properly. Or you can use a Robin boundary condition, so a conjunction of fixed value and fixed gradient and evaluate your boundary conditions properly. If this is a transient case, you can get your initial state from your, manuf from your manufactured solution, evaluate at that time equals zero. Okay? Now, um, why, why is this a suitable? Why is this a suitable methodology? Here, I'm not imposing any sort of constraint on the geometry you're using. I'm not telling that you need to simplify your domain in some region in space. We can choose a solution that will exercise every term in our partial differential equation. So there is no need for us to cut or simplify uh, terms in here. And the only question is, how do I define my manufactured solution? What is the criteria for me to get a solution? Can I put anything in here? There are some guides. I have uh, some literature at the end that will give you some pointers on how to create a solution. The methodology itself should be uh, suitable to almost anything, okay? You have to have some pointers in, uh, in mind. You should get a smooth solution, for instance, trigonometric functions, exponential functions, high order polynomial functions, uh, which are smooth and have uh, differentiation. You should not have trivial derivatives in, the, in your manufactured solution. Uh, you should not have a solution that has uh, singularities in the solution that would make no sense. And you shouldn't have solutions that violate what your solver is doing. So in this case, this will use the temperature in, uh, in Kelvin. It's not prepared to get negative temperatures. If you manufacture a solution that has negative temperatures, this will not work, okay? And uh, the most tricky approach in here is for you to get a solution that after your discretization is applied, you get a small error in coerced meshes so that you don't have to pay a lot of computational price for doing the method of manufacture solutions. Okay. So this will be a quote from, from a text. So when we discretize the governing equations, we are subdividing our problem into a set of finite volumes. Um, instead of solving the, our PDEs in a continuum domain, we are solving it in a discretized space, which will approximate our solution. The approximate solution, which satisfies the discretized solution, is not the same as the exact solution. The solution uh, is not the same as the exact solution. Okay, so I'm hearing someone playing, okay, so <laughs> playing this like some... Okay, so please disconnect the mic while I am, uh, while I am uh, speaking. So, um, as I was saying, so the difference between our 
our mathematical solution and our discretized solution, we call a discretization error. Uh, as this error will decrease with um, the discretization scheme we are using, it's called the order of convergence. And if your scheme is consistent, as you progressively refine your mesh in space and or in time, you should get closer and closer to your mathematical solution. Okay. So, um, we have just to recap a little bit on the method and for us to move forward we decide the solution for our for our for our domain we will calculate the driving term by applying every differential operator from our pd with our manufactured solution and now we need a measure to quantify the error so that as we progressively refine our mesh we can calculate the order of convergence of the method and what we are looking for is to see as which with each progressive refinement of the mesh we get closer and goes closer and closer to the theoretical order of convergence of our method okay so in here I, I will present you three norms that you usually find in literature for assessing the error which is the l1 norm the l2 norm or the l infinity norm and they will take in different considerations for the error all of them can be used to monitor the um, the error in the, in the method of manufactured solutions. For us to calculate the order of convergence, you can see the equation on the right-hand side, the P equation, you will have to use a refinement ratio, which can be approximated by the number of cells you have in your, um, in your finer mesh divided by the, the number of cells in your coarser mesh, okay? And this is raised to the inverse of the dimensionality of your problem. So if it's 2D, it's the square root of the of the um, it's the square root if it's 3d it's the cubic root of of the system and afterwards you can take the natural logarithm of this and you are going to divide this with the um, the natural logarithm of the ratio between the error norms in the coarse mesh divided by the error norms in the finer mesh okay so i think afterwards of this it's the application of uh, of the method of manufactured solutions to the laplace info okay to recap again we're going to decide what our t solution for laplacian form is going to be we're going to apply every differential operator you see in here we're going to calculate the driving term we're going to implement this into the solver we're going to solve this system with appropriate boundary conditions and what we are looking for is progressively refine this in time or space or time and space and check if we are achieving the theoretical order of convergence of our system okay so for this to run in a suitable time I have done some simplification. Here we're going to uh, use the solution in steady state, and we are going to define this in a 2D plane. Okay, so this is going to be a temperature, which depends on the x and y position, which is written by, by this equation, and we're going to use a diffusion coefficient of one to the power of minus five. Okay, uh, we're going to do this mesh refinement studies in a series of five meshes, which is su suitable to run in this, in this demonstration. Uh, from 32 to 512, meaning that this doubles with every progressive mesh, okay, in each x and y coordinate. And what we are going to look for is how to compute the errors and to, how to assess the order of convergence. Okay, so we are going to do this in, uh, I have prepared the cases so I can show you how we are going to calculate the driving terms, how are we going to implement this, and how are we going to get this, uh, this method to work. So, the files in here and the presentation will be provided uh, afterwards and uh, and you should have access to this folder which will have the presentation in here and should have the cases in here okay in here you're going to have um, uh, let me see if i can put this bigger uh, is it better okay then you're going to have access to three three files one for laplace and foam one for scalar transport foam and one for python script a Python script that will generate the source terms or it will compute the source terms for you. Okay. And we're going to start with, uh, with this uh, Python, with this Python script. Uh, for this, you can use whatever idea, IDE you want. I tend to use Spider, which is closer to MATLAB, which I knew how to code before I transition to Python. So it's more familiar to me. You can use VS code if you want to, if you want to, it's not, it's not a problem. Okay. So you can come here, 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 and we'll start with Laplace Info. Okay, so the main thing we're going to use here is SimPy, which is a package for symbolic computation in Python. Okay, that's, we are, that's what we are importing in line 10 of the code. Okay, in line, in line 12, because of the version I'm using, this will put, the, um, this will put uh, 
LaTeX as the output in here. So I'm just disabling that so that we can actually see, see, see the code. Afterwards, in line 15, we are calculating the symbols we need for our, for our manufactured solution. This will be in 3D space. We're only going to use 2D, but it's just to be generic. If you want time, you can include a comma here, put time and put the time in the variables and it should be okay. And afterwards, we're going to create two functions to compute the gradient of a scalar quantity, which is differentiate uh, whatever your scalar quantity is in respect to X, respect to Y, and in respect to Z, and give me a vector with this and how we're going to compute the divergence of a vector quantity, which is get my vector, the first entry derived with respect to X, plus the second entry derived with respect to Y, and the third one with respect to Z, and give me the scalar quantity that comes out of this, okay? In line 32, we're going to define our manufactured solution. This is what we want our end solution to be, okay? And our diffusion coefficient, which enters the, um, the structure of the PDE. And afterwards, we can compute the source term, sorry, in line 38, which is straightforward. It's a Laplace, and it's the divergence of your diffusion, diffusion, um, diffusion term multiplied with the gradient of temperature. Okay? And afterwards, we are going to get this. Uh, here, you'll get this in symbolic fashion. So this is Python code. And we're going to use some Python functionality to convert our uh, Python expressions to C code. And we're going to use a dictionary so that we can transform this SQL functionality into open form uh, syntax so that we can pretty much copy and paste this from one side to the other. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do just out of uh, just out of uh, being picky is to expand uh, powers. So if you have x squared, I want x comma x. If you have y cubed, y cubed, I want y comma y comma y. Okay, and we're going to create this in here. And afterwards, we're going to use this line of code here, which is a nested function. This one will expand the powers for us in the source term, and this one will convert the expression into C code. Okay, this will be a string. Um, and afterwards, we're going to use a dictionary to replace whatever, whatever terms you have in here. I've made this in this fashion. We're not using the exponential, but if you want to add functionality here, just put another one and put the equivalent in open form. It will look for in the code what uh, you're using and replace it accordingly. And finally, in line, that will be done here from line 57 to line 58, and in line 61, uh, we're going to print out the code for the user, okay? So if this does not get stuck, you should get this expression here, which is your source term. Yes? Uh, sure, sure, yes. Ah, you want okay. Can you post the link to your example? Sure. After this, I will get in touch with uh, with the organization. I will give the um, the cases, the presentation, everything, so you, so you have access afterwards. Okay. So this is our source term, and if you want to derive other things, gradients and so on, instead of putting in here uh, st, you can just change this to whatever whatever you want. You can put here the gradient of temperature. If you need to calculate the Neumann boundary condition, it will give you this in here. And this you can multiply with a normal, with a normal of your head and you can get your, your fixed um, your fixed gradient boundary conditions. But okay. Um, so we're going to get our source term. Okay. And now we're going to have to implement this into open form. And we're going to have to implement also uh, boundary conditions. Okay. And for this particular case in here, I forgot to mention, but we are we're going to use all direct level boundary conditions. Okay, for convenience. Okay, so uh, in this folder, in Laplace and Foam, okay, in uh, Solver, we're going to first do this in standard open form fashion. So we're going to copy our Laplace and Foam. We're going to change it to what we need it to do. And we're going to compile and call it my Laplace and Foam. Okay. So in my Laplace and Foam, what do we have? This is the original expression of my Laplace and Foam. And here is the modified equation. So it's exactly the same thing with the addition of a source term. Okay, we're not using the FV solutions for now. We will use it in the next approach. So this will be zero for, for this example. So it's your solution plus a source. How are we creating this source term? You can go to your create fields, which, where, which is where usually you create your, um, your variables. You will see here a section for the method of manufactured solutions. Okay, we're going to get the reference to the x, y, z positions of your cell centers, and we're going to get the x, y, z positions of your face centers. 
Okay, we're going to create um, a couple of fields for the um, for the error. So I'm going to jump a little bit to the source and then we'll come back. So we're going to create a field to store the source. Okay, it's going to have the dimensions appropriate so that it can have so that it can solve the equations. It's going to be initialized to zero, and afterwards at the bottom we're going to loop through the source term, get the x and y coordinates of our um, of our cell centers, and apply the solution that we have computed in Python. Okay, this is a, just a little bit prettier instead of just copying this and being just a, one line that is very big that you cannot uh, check. Okay, and afterwards we're going to have to compute the errors so that with each mesh we get, we get a measure of the error. And for that, we're going to also have to create some fields. I will just show you the equations of the calculations of the errors so that we can are reminded. So the L2 norm is going to be the difference between the square difference between our manufactured solution and the result from the finite volume method multiplied with the volume of the cell. And afterwards, we're going to divide everything by the summation of all the volumes, and we're going to take the square root of this. Okay. The L1 norm is going to be the, the magnitude of the difference between our method of manufactured solutions and our finite volume solution. Uh, solution multiplied with the volume and divided by the summation of the volumes. And our L infinity is going to be the maximum magnitude difference between the errors, between the, um, the values of the solution. Okay. So this we're going to create a field for, to store the analytical solution. Okay. Um, and we're going to create a field to store the error. Afterwards, we're going to populate our analytical solution. We're going to take the X and Y coordinates of each cell center. We're going to apply our manufactured solution. We're going to do the same for the boundaries. Why not? It's not going to be actually used in this example, but you stay here uh, how you loop through the, through the boundaries. And this will be it for populating both of these. Okay, now inside my Laplacian form, you'll get a, a section for the method of manufactured solutions. And what do you need here? You need a reference to the volume of each cell. Okay, you need to compute the error, which is going to be our analytical solution minus our, um, our solution from the finite volume method, and then we take the magnitude of this. Okay, and afterwards, how you calculate the error norm? So we're going to use for the L1, it's our magnitude of the error multiplied with the volume, with the volume, we sum everything, and we divide it by the summation of all of the volumes. Okay, the, we're going to take the square of the error multiplied with the volume, divided by the summation of the volumes, and take the square root of everything. And for the L infinity norm, we're going to take the maximum of the error, of the, yeah, the error in here. Okay, the rest is the same as the standard uh, Laplacian form. Okay, so now we can straightforwardly compile this. Okay. Okay. And now we need to add boundary conditions, in this case, Dirichlet boundary conditions that will represent our manufactured solution. I have copied the total temperature boundary condition, and I'm going to change this because it's a fixed value boundary condition so that we can just implement our manufactured solution. So in here, in update coefficients, we're going to implement your, your manufactured solution. So we're going to take the reference to the face centers of each cell, we're going to, to create a field to store the result. And we're going to loop through this field, get the X and Y coordinates of our face, apply the manufactured solution, and afterwards assign the result to the, um, to the, to the face. OK, this so far is not anything fancy. Now, what do we need to do in here? We need to do the, um, the first, we need to, to compile this. Otherwise, it will complain. So solver, uh, I don't know if you can watch this. Let me see if I can, if I can, is this better? Better? The font? Yeah. Okay. So sorry, you're going to go to boundary conditions, W make your boundary conditions. <laughs> okay. So now I will prepare this to be in the, um, I will prepare this to be in the cases and case one. Okay, good. Now, 
to prepare the, um, the cases for the method of manufacture solution. I have created here an all run and an all clean script and a base case. Okay, we're going to look uh, first into the base case and afterwards into the all run. Okay, so base case, your zero is going to be the manufactured solution or the boundary you have just created. Okay, this is going to be for this is 2D case, so left, right, top, and bottom is, has your fixed value under condition, front and back is empty to, to make it to uh, the Okay. Afterwards, your constant is going to have the definition of your diffusion of your, um, of your DT, which is one to the power of minus five, which is what we agreed before we started this. Okay. And finally, your system. So block mesh will be the dimensions that you we have in here. It's just a sorry. That I mentioned we have in here, and it has one cell in the zeta direction. It has the definitions of the boundaries. Nothing, nothing else is fancy in here. In your control dict, you're just going to have to specify that you want to include the library of your boundary conditions in here, so that it knows what your boundary condition is. And afterwards, you are going to say this one does not need to go to to ten seconds. It is one step solution, but sure. Um, and the only thing you'll have to be a little bit key, a little bit picky upon is the right precision. You should increase this from whatever you consider to be default to a high number, 12, 12 13, 14, it's okay. This will influence your end result. Um, and afterwards, in your uh, how you're going to discretize this equation, you're going to use this in steady state, which is also what we agreed before doing this exercise, and you're going to use a Gauss linear uncorrected scheme, we have a structured mesh that is no need for non-orthogonal uh, corrections, okay? And we're going to use a linear interpolation scheme. Okay, how are we going to solve the system? Okay, we're going to use a conjugate gradient solver. We're going to solve this to one to the power of minus 11. And by safety, we're going to say that uh, if you create a new step, if it's below one to the power of minus 10, this is converged, okay? It's just a safety check. This should solve in one in one step. There are no nonlinearities in, in this equation. Okay, um, and this will be it. So this will have an all run. The all run inside of this of this test case will just create your block mesh, decompose your mesh, run it in parallel, reconstruct it, delete the processor folders, and create a file dot form so that you can visualize the result in parallel. Okay. And the all clean will just clean the case. That's pretty much what it will do. In the all run before, uh, sorry, here, here, and here. Okay, this is a little bit bigger, not doing anything complicated. This is just doing for i to one to five, which is mesh one, mesh two, mesh three, mesh four, mesh five. Uh, compute the number of elements I have from 32 up to 512. Uh, we're going to run this in parallel just to show that the calculations are, this is programmed to run in parallel, copy this to the new name, go into the folder, uh, clean the folder if it needs to be clean, change the number of elements uh, from 32, which is in the base, to whatever number is calculated now, and adjust the number of domains for, for the parallel run, run in parallel, and afterwards come back to the original uh, to the original uh, folder so that you can copy again, go in, clean, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we're going to run this. Uh, sorry, I have this already in the other one. So clear, I'll run. Okay. While this runs, I will explain the other file in here, which is called the order of convergence. This is just an Excel file that will do the calculation of the order of convergence. Okay, so we are going to calculate here. We are going to put in here the L1, L2, and L infinity norms. We're going to calculate the refinement ratio because we are doubling the number of cells in each direction. This should be should be two. And afterwards, we're going to assess the order of convergence from the manufacturer solutions we are getting. I'm going to clean this. Okay. Um, this is straightforward. It's the application of the other equations. They are they are straightforward. So it's the uh, refine. It's the number of cells of your finer mesh divided by the coerced mesh raised to the dimensionality of the problem, this case is 2D, and afterwards the application of the order of convergence here, which is the logarithm of your coerced mesh divided by the finer one, divided by the logarithm of, of your refinement ratio, okay? And this is what we want to observe, if it will go to the theoretical order of convergence, which for the Gauss linear should be second order, okay? 
So let me see how this is going. We are in mesh five. So if you go to the log file, because we asked to print here, you should get the, um, the error norms. Okay, so each one of these files has the error norms in here. Okay, and you can just uh, create a bash utility. This is straightforward to do it, just to do a, a tail in every one of these files to collect the information. I have made one uh, which will go into the 12 previous lines of the log name of my Laplacian phone. Okay. This will get me the, all of the error norms of the meshes that are inside the phone, just for convenience, instead of copying everything in, in each file in here. So now you can pass the solutions in here convert this to, or split this by semicolon. Okay. Now you can copy this and put it in here. Okay. And this will calculate the order of convergence for you. For this case, for um, Laplacian foam and for this solution, you pretty much get a theoretical second order convergence of, of the scheme in here. Okay. This was made with structured meshes and this is mesh dependent. So if you have unstructured meshes, you have corrections and the corrections or the scheme to discretize with corrections should give you second order. So if you apply these corrections, you are hoping to get a similar output to what you see in here. Okay. So this is the open foam standard way to do this, to doing this, but this is solver invasive. You have to copy the solver, you have to change things in the actual solver. And uh, we can we can do a little bit uh, less invasive approach by using code functionality. Okay, this will be the second case you'll see in this folder. Okay, in this folder now we're going to use code functions. So code boundary conditions, code uh, source terms, and code function objects to compute the error norms. Okay, uh, the all of the scripts in here are exactly the same, copying the files, running the cases. Now we're going just to look to the base so that we can see. Um, so that we can see this coded functionality. Okay, so inside zero, you will see a temperature that will have a coded fixed value boundary condition applied to left, right, top, and bottom, as we have seen before. And the syntax in here is the following. Uh, you're going to define the code or what you want the, the boundary condition to do inside the code section within this, uh, these marks in here. Okay, so we're going to get a reference to the patch a reference to the um, a vector to the x, y, z the positions of the faces in the patch, okay? And we're going to get a reference to the field storing the information of the patch. We're going to loop through either the patch or the surface um, or this, uh, this vector field storing the face center coordinates. We're going to get the x, y coordinates of the faces and apply the, the manufacturer solution. So also, so far straightforward to, to apply. Okay. Afterwards, you're going to have um, your source term, which you are going to implement using the um, scalar code uh, functionality of FV options. We're going to apply this to the temperature field. We're going to give it a name for the source term, and you're going to add the code in this section for this example, okay? And what we're going to do here is a little bit different. Uh, but I'll guide you through it. First, we're going to get a reference to the X, Y, Z, the coordinates of your cell centers. We're going to get a reference to the field that will store the, um, the, um, the source term. We're going to loop through this field and assign the temperature at the cell, the source term at the cell center in here. And afterwards, from, uh, from integration of the file and volume method, we're going to multiply this with the volume. And since this is a source term, we're going to subtract, we're going to put the minus sign in here. Okay, and that's why we'll need the reference to the volume that you'll see in here. Okay, so finally we need to compute the errors and the errors you can do in the code function object. It's not also doing anything fancy. So inside control dict, you will have a section for functions and inside this section for functions, you can create a code uh, a code uh, a code function object. Okay, and inside code write, and this, this marks in here, you can put what your, what your um, code function object should do. And what it should do is the following. First, go and find my temperature field, my solution. Get me the reference to the cell centers. Get me the reference to the face centers. Get me the reference to the volume. Create a field so that I can store 
the difference between the manufactured solution and uh, and the, um, and the, the solution from the finite volume method. Uh, loop through this field and uh, give me the difference between my manufactured solution and what solution has been found has been achieved by the finite volume method. Okay, do this for the interior cells and for the boundaries, and afterwards compute my error norms as we have seen before. Okay, afterwards I'm going to choose to write this uh, this um, this field so that I can visualize this in Paraview to see to see the errors if I want. Okay, this one will take a little bit longer to run because it will compile everything at runtime, so it will run a little bit slower than than the other one, but it's less invasive than the previous approach because we have not changed the original solver. We have are just using the code that functionality that you have available. So let me first load open foam. Uh, sorry, uh, here I'll run. Okay. So this will give you exactly the same results as the previous approach. This is not changing the solver. So this is the added, this is the added bonus of using this. The syntax is not that confusing. So it should be it should be okay. Okay. So we'll have to wait a little bit. I'm going to open the um, I'm going to open the one from before in here. Okay. This was a previous solution in another computer. This one is in here. Okay. So this one will take a little bit. Okay. So and while this runs, we can we can make some time by visualizing some results. Um, okay, so Paraview and whatever I have named dot foam. Okay. So this will be the temperature in here, which should slightly resemble the temperature in here and you should have in here where the error is located and as you if you want to see where the error is located in uh, in your uh, in your uh, domain you can accompany this as we progressively refine the mesh so uh, let me see if i can if i can do this so here you will stay uh, i have a question sorry uh, Thanks for the talk. Yeah, does your code depend on certain version of open form? Uh, this was this approach in here. The second one was made for uh, ESI. I don't know if the dot call the dot org version has this code functionality. I've not tried it. Uh, if you want to implement this independent of version, you have the first approach, which should change the actual solver, and you can do this in extended extend uh, dot com or dot org functions. Uh, uh, no, 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 not the code, the first approach where you copy the solver, yeah, yeah. you will put everything hard coded, let's call it that way, and it will be okay. The form extended will not have coded functionality currently available to it. Okay, so let's see another mesh that is a little bit more refined. Okay, and we're going to do the transform and we're going to move this in the X direction by 0. Point something. This is too short. Uh, this is 0. 0.8, I think. Okay, so this here, this one here, and check the differences of uh, here. So this, the error has decreased quite a lot. So one is very big, the other one is very small, but you can check where the error is located. You can also check if your temperature is approaching more and more your, uh, your, um, your manufactured solution. Okay, let me see if this has ended or where it is. It is in the last mesh. We can wait a little bit if you do not mind. Since this is only solving one time and the second one the error is converged, so it will, it will stop. It has not yet started to solve. Okay, good. So this has finished. I'm going to use the same utility to collect the, the results in here. So I'm going to come back here. Let me see if I can show this to everyone. Okay, so I'm, this is just a bash tool. I can also make this available if you want later. Um, 
to 12, and this is called Laplacian foam. Okay, put it in here. So it should be exactly the same solution as before. The thing is, we are not being as invasive in the solver as as we were before. So that um, text columns. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. So exactly the same value. We'll get second order in the first one, second order in the, the second one. Nothing fancy in here, just showing a different approach to do this. So since we are we only have 15 more minutes in here, I can I can at least we can at least talk a little bit about uh, about uh, scalar transport foam. So for the tutorial in scalar transport foam, if you want to use this in your own personal computer, it's okay. Uh, in this equation, we are adding the diffusion term. Okay, so we are going to compute this with Python again. I will show you the script, and we're going to implement this also into D for a steady case with a little bit more exotic uh, solution. Just pretty for uh, for, uh, for for the paper in here. Okay, and we're going to increase a little bit the, um, the diffusion coefficient, and we're going to define some velocity in here. Okay. And we're going to run this in exactly the same meshes. And if you remember, uh, when I talked about how you select a solution, you'll have to have a solution that uh, has a small error in the um, in the in co with coarse meshes, so that you save computational effort. Um, if I run in these five meshes, you will see that this will approach second order, but not 1.999 as you saw before. But if you keep on increasing the number of meshes, so six, seven, eight this will more and more tend to second order, okay? And, um, okay, I will, I'm going to show you the, the Python script that does this computation, which is exactly the same the one as before, but different solution. And while this runs, maybe I will just let the, the other case to compute and that will be better. Just a second, please. So Laplace and no scalar transport foam. Okay, 2106, you will run. Okay, well, we see the Python script. Okay, so you should have the second one, which is scalar transport foam. It will be exactly the same script, except for this portion in here and the source term. So this now is a little bit more exotic solution. It will have a couple of swirls to the solution, the velocity, your diffusion coefficient and how you calculate the source term. Now it includes the divergence of the velocity times temperature. Okay, the script below will be exactly the same. So now you just press play. The source term is substantially bigger because the solution is not as easy to compute if you wanted to do by hand, but Python will take care of that workload for you. Okay, so you can copy this, go to your, um, go to your FV options in here, And we're going to put the equation that we have copied in here. This one was not as pretty as the other one. I did not format it correctly, but we just copy and paste in here and it should be okay. The rest of, the rest of this is the same. Same structure, same structure, different solution, same implementation in here. Okay. And this will, this will, this will run. Okay, let's, this is in the third mesh. Okay. And I will at least show you in here, we also use different uh, different uh, numerical schemes. So we are using here a linear up with, depending on the gradient of temperature. Okay, so this will have an explicit uh, gradient correction and uh, this will not solve in one step, you'll have a couple of them, sorry. You will have a couple of them in here. Okay, so let's see if Mesh2 already has pretty images so that you can see that uh, uh, yeah. So temperature, okay, it will start to have some swirls to your, to your solution and you can post process this to be pretty image like this. If you want, uh, if you want some tips on how to get actually very good pictures into the, you can download Paraview 3.98, which allow you to get vectorial images out of it. 
be aware that they can be very heavy, but if it's 2D, it should be it should be okay and you get a vectorial image. Um, and okay, afterwards you're going to compute the error as we have seen before. I have this already pre-made in here. Okay, the error of the of the solution, and you will see um, you will see a little bit not as theoretical as as you saw before. You'll see here that this will uh, be 1.9 if you keep on increasing the refinement this will approach to more and more and more okay i don't know if i have if i have uh, solutions up to eight mesh in here i can check uh, not in this computer okay i will put it in here you will see later that this will be uh, 1.92, 1.95, 1.99, and if you keep on increasing, it will it will approach to more and more. The problem in here is that you're no longer in a feasible uh, in a feasible situation for demonstration. It will, this will be 250, a quarter of a million, a million, four million, 16 million, and this is this will take time for you to to calculate. But it will show that it has second order convergence. Okay. And this will be it for the presentation. So if you have questions, I will be happy to attend, uh, attend to them. So this is the um, this is the literature, and we have submitted a paper for the Open Form Journal showing a approach similar to this, but it will semi-automate the process. You'll just put the equations, you'll get you the files, you'll make it run, and it should be okay. So thank you very much for your attention. So, questions. Let's see in the chat if I have something. Mm, no. Yeah. yeah. Oh, do I need a microphone or uh, it's an actually it's actually a good question though. And the calculation of the source transition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will not use your I've never used that quite on the same. Usually, I do not, it should not. I think the method of manufacturing solution should handle this, should be able to handle this continuity. I don't know if that's advisable because usually you want smooth solutions, and if you and if you have this continuity, it will possibly cause some issues. As to the actual answer, if it's possible to do an if statement, you can do if bigger than something, yeah. execute this line and it will calculate the source term up to that value. If the other, calculate the other part and get to the other value. When you implement, you'll have to do an if statement. If temperature is higher than whatever you want to calculate, apply this source term. If it's lower than the other one, apply the other source term. So, yeah. But, I've never worked with solution with discontinuities. Yeah. So if you read in literature, they will in literature you will always find that the solution is to be smooth. And it needs to be smooth for you have to have the good so derivatives, I'm infinite. Assume it's smooth distribution of the source term will be smooth. Because it's assume it's smooth distribution of velocity or whatever, but the stress won't be smooth because you'll have a unit in the source term. But not the source term won't be distributed because it would be a distributed source term. So you could change the oh, okay. I think you already did. Yeah, but, but the, the way you're you're projecting might be both in that like Ah, could you please repeat the question for the unwanted attendance? Okay, maybe we need a mic to. <laughs> you can, you can hear you, I guess. Yeah, you can repeat the question. Yeah, yeah, sure. The the question was if um, if uh, the introduction of source terms with non-linearities would be possible. Is this correct? Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, any other question? Yeah. Would it be possible to apply this method for fluid structure interaction? If it would be possible to apply the method for the field structure interaction. 
uh, you have to satisfy a dynamic and particular market condition. Mm. Okay, uh, with fluid structure interaction, you are going to have uh, you are going to have a solution for your solid domain and a solution for your fluid domain, right? This solution must satisfy the climatic and uh, condition of the so the velocity should be same and, and force. Yeah. So this must be satisfied by. Yeah, this should be possible to do if your solution for your uh, fluid has one velocity and your solution for your solid has another velocity the same yeah. and it should be possible to apply yeah how you will actually enforce it that might be a little bit trickier but yes yes <laughs> usually this is the problem with them not the problem but the peculiarity with the method of manufacture solution which solution do you choose because this allows you a lot of variety and freedom in choosing the solution and some will work far better than others and uh, i was Trying to show the example in here that one will give you perfect second order conversion. This one will, will get you a little bit, uh, a little bit less. And as you get wilder and wilder with the solution, it can it can get meshes that are finer and finer for you to be in a um, asymptotic regime that you can actually check that it's converging. Okay, and for for a um, little bit more exotic cases where you have fluid structure interaction, you have to find a solution that will satisfy both the, the cases you want. Yes. I don't understand. Sorry, when I'm picking a case, when you're picking BS capacity space that has like a classical analytical solution. No. Uh, sorry, the question was if I'm picking a case, would it be a case to where I need to have an analytical solution? No, no. And the advanced the solution has to be physical? No, no. The solution does not have any does not have to have any physical meaning at all this is this will be a mathematical exercise if you want to think it that way the thing you have to be aware is that if you're supplying things that the solver cannot handle it will not work so if the temperature is negative the solver is not expecting it to be negative it, it will not work or you should not design solutions like that and expect it to work at least yeah. Yeah, that will be that will be what's known as a method of exact solutions. You'll find a solution for a specific case. The problem with that is that you'll most likely have to simplify the um, the expression. And here, I'm not telling you to simplify anything. I'm telling you, in fact, choose a solution that will exercise everything in your partial differential equation, so that you have any mistake in your code, it will be brought up. Okay, and uh, out of also practice, I it, you should also make sure that the, um, the magnitude of your different operators is in the same range. So your divergence, the magnitude of it should be in the same range as your Laplacian or whatever operators you want. Otherwise you can uh, overshadow one of, the, one of the terms and that is not uh, suitable, okay? You want to check ideally equal contribution and some error, it will, it will something. Since we have some time, or at least two minutes, I can show you what will happen if you have some mistake. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, you can use time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I did not show that in here also because it will take a little bit. If it's only marching in time, uh, it, it can be it can be okay, but uh, the time dependent solutions will take more time than I have to show to show in here. So. If you supply wrongly the, um, we can do something like this even. If you want, if you supply wrong, wrongly your diffusion constant, okay? What will happen in the method of manufacture solution? Yeah, it's one to the power of minus four that you're adding in here. So this one will run fast because this one is the hard coded one, so sorry. Okay. This one will throw your order of convergence to zero, drop immediately. You, you might see some convergence from the first mesh to the second one. You might not see anything from the third to the third, and then it will it will get off the rails very fast. Okay, so fourth mesh. Can it be repulsive if you can see? Then when when you get very close to the fusion, then your order of actually goes to zero and goes up because you you run out of gas. I've never had a solution that close to being actual zero, so. 
that was has not been a problem so far. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Good luck the yeah. Then let. Uh, okay, it's reconstructing social. Okay, good. Okay, so we can pass here the. Um, we can pass this in here, sorry. Okay. Um, you will see that when you have um, when you have second order, you're expecting even a structured mesh that if you refine by double, the error decreases by a factor of four. Okay. You, as I was telling you, you might see something from the first one to the second one. From the second one to the third one, you might also see, but as you progressively refine the mesh, the error you have supplied in the code from either coding, from bad parameters, from whatever mistake you have, will come out with a sharp decrease in the order of convergence. You'll see this from the third mesh to the fourth one. It's got negligible reduction in the error. So you have zero order of convergence, something is wrong with the code. Okay, either with the code, either with the setup you have supplied or with the actual code. For this case, no. Okay, and you will also see this from the fourth mesh to the to the fifth one. There is also no no convergence. Yes. So if you run a phase and you see these low uh, convergence, yeah. is there a way to sort of start figuring out where the error might be? Sure, you have to deconstruct everything and go step by step to identify where the error is. This will tell you that there is an error, not where the error is located. It can be in your setup, and if that's your error, it's easy. Um, if you can be in the code, and if it's the code, then you'll have to see, okay, what do I have in my equations? Laplacian, get, get, let's check if a solution only for the, for the Laplacian is working. If it's working, okay, cross Laplacian. You have a solution for the divergence. Is the divergence working? No, okay, where in the divergence is it happening? And you have to unfold again and go in and go in and go in. So this will be an indicator that you have an error. It will not tell you where the error is located. And uh, Okay, that will that will be it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, you choose a maximum bound in that one. You would expect the, 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 the relative order of convergence. And now we, we are choosing the as non because you. There is no particular reason for you to choose one of them. You're monitoring three, in fact. And what I want to see here is if all of them get uh, order of convergence or if some of them might not have order of convergence. And then we can try to discuss why L infinity is converging to first order and the other ones are converging to second order, for instance. So you're just checking if there is an order of convergence. Yes. You're not expecting a priori and a precise order of convergence. For one specific error norm, no. I'm expecting to have order of convergence, ideally in all of them. Well, if you want to choose what open form uses for the linear solver, is a weighted L1 norm. If that will make it uh, at least easier to choose, you can look at the L1. Okay. Yeah. Usually, what we use is uh, L1 and L infinity will give you boundaries. L2 will be somewhere, uh, somewhere in the middle, and we want to see what the dispersion in the error is. Yeah, you're kind of using a bitcoin tool 
Did you try to apply the same parallel format on this solution set? No. 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 Okay. So because sometimes uh, with with the higher order methods, uh, you do not converge because you are not employing a, a proper parallel format. So. Yeah, but in here, open for me, we'll have second uh, second order scheme. So we'll have one integration point. So this is what, what do you use? If you use higher order schemes, probably you have to use something different. Yeah, I think that's the same uh, following question that Jeff asked before, and wasn't clear if I should integrate the, the source code as in the source mm -hmm. and variance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're evaluating the source from the descent. You're, yeah. You're, yeah. you're numerically calculating. So you're introducing an error to the source from. But you're saying it's second order, so it won't destroy the solution. Yeah. But it's not exactly. It's not exactly the score. It will be a real pain to do that. So far, the methodology has been done like this because this is what you find in theoretical. In if you go to literature, this is how they will implement the, the method of manufactured solutions. Yeah. But yeah, I, I guess if you wanted a higher order to verify an higher order method, you have to integrate the source and use the Okay. Any other question? Okay, we can talk during the conference if you have questions. So thank you very much for attending. Okay. Hopefully soon. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, this uh, this should help a lot in documentation because for you to use this, you need to know what PD is solving. So you'll need to report, I am using Laplacian of this, the versions of that, whatever it is. And if you show that it is working to second order, then we can all be a little bit more comfortable that everything is implemented correctly. Okay, so thank you.